Okay, so as I said, ladies and gentlemen, we have already started chapter 11. So it's been a while since we started it. So I'm going to weave in some review as best I can. Okay. This chapter, what we've covered and what it's mostly about is all about intermolecular forces. Tell me, what does the prefix inter mean? Between. Okay, great. So if I have one water molecule here and I have a completely separate one here, what are the forces that exist between these two separate molecules? Okay. Let's review what the types are. What is the weakest intermolecular force called? London dispersion forces, okay? What's the next strongest one? Dipole, dipole, and the strongest? Hydrogen bonding, great. All right, all covalent compounds have which type? LDFs, London dispersion forces, great. How do you know if a compound also has dipole-dipole forces? Yeah, it's is the molecule polar or nonpolar? And that's why I said when we started this chapter, you can't just chuck out all that you've learned in chapters 8 and 9 with the shapes and everything because if I give you a covalent compound, I will still, in this chapter, be expecting you to be able to draw it, tell me its shape, and really for the reasons of being able to decide if it's a polar or non-polar molecule because that's going to determine what intermolecular forces it has. So you can't just forget everything you learned about the Vesper theory. Right? You've got to keep that in your brain. What we're going to start off with today, guys, is a lot of real-world application. So I think today's lesson is going to be a little more interesting than, than most. I mean, of course, every lesson in here is fantastic, but, you know. This one will be, I think, a little more relatable. Okay? So for any of you that have some sort of body of water near your house, maybe it's a pond, a creek, something, for example, I have a creek near my house, and in the spring and the summertime at this creek, I see a lot of these water bugs, okay? And these water bugs sit on the surface of the water. They're not floating, because floating would imply that they're like in the water and that's like a buoyancy issue. These bugs are actually sitting on top of the water. They are not breaking the plane. Same thing here. You can get a paper clip to sit on top of a glass of water. This is an issue of something called surface tension. Okay? The resistance to breaking that plane. And this is connected to intermolecular forces. Liquids that have very strong intermolecular forces will have high surface tensions. Okay. For example, these both of these pictures are showing us water. Okay, got it drawn right here. Does water have London dispersion forces? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. All covalents do. Does it have dipole-dipole forces? Yes, because it's a polar molecule. Does it have hydrogen bonding? Yes, it does. Okay, now let's just take an aside here and talk about the requirements for hydrogen bonding. Obviously, it's got to have hydrogen. What must, what else must the compound also have? Okay, it's got to have either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, and then there was even one additional requirement. Yeah, yeah. The hydrogen has to be actually chemically bonded to 
N O or F, which it definitely is. But the point I'm trying to make here is water has all three intermolecular forces. It's held pretty tightly together. So water has a relatively high surface tension. Now, could we as humans do this? Why not? How come the bug can do it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weight issue, okay? The, the force of this bug from gravity is less than the forces required to break through those intermolecular forces. Our weight, the force of us, our weight, is greater. So we can't do this because we, the force of our weight is enough to break through those intermolecular forces where the bug isn't. Okay? Or if you're from where I am, I'm from the deep south. I don't know if you guys knew that, but we don't call them bugs. We call them bugs. Okay? <laughs> it's not a water bug, it's a water bug. All right. Anyway. <laughs> so Here's something else that's a factor of intermolecular forces, and I'm actually going to skip through this and jump right to the a picture, because I think it's easier to understand with this in front of you. It's something called capillary action. And I'm going to give you an example of when you see this at a doctor's office. It also has a biology connection, all right? So let's say you go to the doctor's office and your doctor needs to test your blood for something. And they don't need to take like a whole vial of blood from your arm. They just need a small sample. So they, they do the little, the little finger prick and you get that little bead of blood at the tip of your finger. And sometimes they will um, test the blood directly. Like if you, all, if you know anybody that's a diabetic, they have those test strips. That can test your blood directly, but sometimes they need to collect just a small sample of blood and take that small sample somewhere else. And they will use sometimes what's called a capillary tube. And it's basically like, think of a drinking straw, except it's made of glass and it has a much, much, much smaller diameter. Okay. You know those like um, those coffee stir sticks that are like very small straws? It's even a smaller diameter than that. And it's made of glass. And they take this capillary tube and they just touch it to that little bead of blood and the blood goes right up the tube spontaneously. <laughs> right up. And this is a tube that's open at both ends and the blood doesn't come out, it just stays in the tube, and then they can carry it across the office to whatever piece of equipment they need to run your blood. This picture is like a blown up picture of that tube. Here's the end of the tube. This is your blood. Okay. Now blood is 85% what? Water. Okay. So each of these little white dots is representing one water molecule, right? And there's two vocabulary words that you probably learned in biology, but I just want to make sure you remember them because they come into play here. Cohesion and adhesion. Cohesive forces and adhesive forces. This term, cohesion, it means something sticks to itself. Cohesion, something sticks to itself. And you guys tell me, will one water molecule stick to another one? Yes or no? Yeah. What are the forces that cause that to happen? Yeah, intermolecular forces. All three intermolecular forces are the cohesive forces holding these water molecules together. Add
adhesion means something sticks to something else. Okay. For example, um, scotch tape is an adhesive. Think what tape, think about the purpose of tape. You use it to stick one thing to something else. You use it to get a piece of paper to stick to the wall. Okay. Adhesion. Well, here's the deal, guys. The glass that they use for capillary tubes is called polarized glass. Polarized, meaning the glass contains polar molecules. Do you think, would a water molecule be attracted to the polar molecules in the glass? What do you think? Yeah. What kind of attraction is that? What are Yeah, dipole dipole attraction. The negative end of the water molecule will be attracted to the more positive end of some of these glass molecules. That's adhesion. Something sticking to something else. If you could watch this blood go up the tube in like super slow motion, here's what you would see. It's an alternation between adhesion and cohesion. You'd see like this water molecule, for example, sticking to the glass because they are both polar. Dipole, dipole attraction, that would be adhesion. Well, since this water molecule sticks to his buddies, through cohesion, he's going to bring his buddies along with him. And then this water molecule that came along with this guy is going to then stick to the glass, adhesion, and he brings his buddies along with him, cohesion, and it's just crawling up the side of that tube, adhesion, cohesion, adhesion, cohesion. And it's a totally spontaneous process. You don't have to do anything to get that to happen. Something that's a little more biology, um, maybe you've done this in like elementary school. If you take a white flower of some kind, like a daisy or a, I don't know, are daisies white? Yeah, you can, there's a white variety of daisy. If you put it in a vase with water that has blue food coloring mixed in it, the flower will eventually turn blue, right? Have you ever done that? Okay the water travels up the stem of that flower using the same process, capillary action. Okay. But again, this is a result of intermolecular forces. Okay. Here's something else you might see in real life. For those of you that are car enthusiasts, or I should say, for those of you that have a car nice enough that you care what it looks like, I don't have that problem, because I don't have a car nice enough that I actually care what it looks like. But let's say, you know, you graduate from college, you get a really awesome job, and they give you like a signing bonus, okay? And what do you do? You go out and you buy a brand new cherry red BMW convertible. Good for you. Celebrate your success, right? People that have really fancy cars tend to get them washed often and detailed often, and they'll get um, a nice wax job on the paint. It makes the paint look really, really sharp. Have you ever seen a waxed car when it rains? What happens? Yeah, the water beads up and it just rolls right off, okay? Imagine that this red layer here is a layer of wax, okay? And this is a water droplet because it's raining. You may or may not know this. Things like waxes, oils, um, fats, these families of molecules are all very non polar substances. Okay. Nonpolar. What you may or may not know, and I'm sure you could probably guess this anyway, 
things that are polar and nonpolar do not like to be in contact with each other. Is water polar? Yeah. Wax, nonpolar. You will get this beating up because the, this water droplet is trying to minimize its contact with this nonpolar surface. Okay? So you get cohesive forces. Water is attracted to itself, but it is not attracted to that nonpolar surface. So there's cohesion, but no adhesion. And the vice versa situation, the reverse is true as well. Okay, let's say your car is made out of a polar substance. I mean, for this is completely ridiculous, but let's say you're driving a car made out of glass. <laughs> Why would you do that? That's stupid. Okay, <laughs> you're driving a car where the hood of your car, the whole car is made out of polarized glass. And it's not raining water, it's raining canola oil. Okay, I don't know. Just go with me on this, all right? Check your weather, everyone. You would see the same exact phenomenon. Polar surface, non-polar droplet, you're gonna get beating again, all right? Now, tell me this, see if you can figure this out. In both situations, you would see this beating behavior. But why is it that a water, a bead of water, would be a little bit tighter, a little bit more formed as a bead instead of, or rather than the canola oil, which is still going to bead up, but it's not going to be as tight or as nicely formed a bead? Okay, water's polar. It's got all of these, right? What would a droplet of oil? I mean, it has cohesive forces. What are its cohesive forces? LDFs. They're there, but they're weaker. So you would see a droplet of oil, but it, it wouldn't be as tight and as like nicely formed as a bead of water. All right, here's something else. Do you know this word, viscosity? If I say that a liquid is very viscous, can you give me some examples of a viscous liquid? Okay, lava, sure. Syrup, what else? Something that's kind of like syrup, honey. Thicker than honey. Can you think of anything? Molasses. Molasses. Yeah. These are very viscous liquids. Okay. When you think about viscosity, think about if you were pouring these liquids down some sort of an incline. You know, if you just tip a glass of water over down an incline, water's just going to go and run right down. If you were to tip over like a glass of molasses, it will flow down that incline, but it's going to like ooze down the incline, okay? They resist flow. And again, it's a factor of intermolecular forces. The stronger those forces are, the more viscous the liquid will be. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a, an exception here. All right, let's think, let's imagine you have two inclines. You pour a glass of water down one, and you pour a glass of motor oil down the other one. Which liquid is more viscous, water or motor oil? Motor oil, okay? All kinds of oils are, are more viscous than water. But wait a second. Didn't we just say that oils are very nonpolar substances? Which means they have what kind of forces only? LDFs. 
So they shouldn't be very viscous because they don't have a whole lot of forces holding them together. Well, here's the thing, guys, and they, they've asked questions on the AP exam about this because it's the opposite of what you would think. Something nonpolar, LDFs only, should not be very viscous, okay? Um, shouldn't have a large surface tension, things like that. But it does because, you may not know this, waxes, oils, fats, these molecules are not only nonpolar, but they are very large in size. They're these carbon chains and they're very long carbon chains. I want you to go back to the notes we took at the beginning of this chapter. And there was a word that I made you circle, highlight, draw exclamation points around it. Polarizability. What does that word mean? The ease with which. Okay. It's basically how easy is it for this nonpolar molecule to be pulled into what we called a momentary dipole, meaning it's just barely polar and only for a split second. If you look at your notes, large molecules, as the size of the molecule increases, its polarizability increases. Oil molecules, fat molecules, things that are in waxes, nonpolar, but very large, which means they're very polarizable, Here's the deal, guys. The collective London dispersion forces in something like oil collectively are stronger than all three of these put together in water. Okay, now that's, that's kind of weird because usually we think of London dispersion forces as being pretty weak, and they are, but when you have really big molecules their collective LDFs end up being stronger than all three of these. Okay. So I just want you to be aware of that sort of anomaly to what we've said here. But the take home message here is guys, all of this that we've talked about, all of this is a factor of intermolecular forces. Okay. We're just going to do a small little conceptual section. We're not going to get into the math today that deals with this, these concepts. We'll do that next week. Okay, but the second half of this chapter has to do with phase changes. Okay, melting, boiling, and those are processes that involve intermolecular forces. It involves breaking intermolecular forces, which is why it's in this chapter, okay? So first and foremost, this is just a pet peeve of mine. People use these terms interchangeably and they do not mean the same thing, okay? Vaporization, or you could say boiling. Those two things do mean the same thing liquid to gas, but to be specific, you are at the boiling temperature, at the boiling point. Whereas evaporation, same phase change, liquid to gas, but it's below the boiling point. You know, if you leave a cup of water out for a week, the water will evaporate eventually. At no point, though, was that water at the boiling temperature. These don't mean the same thing. And just to make sure that we are all educated 16, 17, 18 year olds in this room, what is the boiling temperature of water in Celsius? 100. 100. What is it in Fahrenheit, by the way? 212. Very good. Okay. We're not going to get into the math, but when we do, you're going to see this symbol a lot. We have not <coughs> seen delta H in a while. 
heat enthalpy delta H vape, which does not mean the vape like you're thinking vape. Okay. <laughs> Vaporization. Okay. All it is is just the heat required to vaporize a substance. Okay. And again, why is this in this chapter? Because vaporizing something involves breaking intermolecular forces. Okay. Now, we are still, we won't be for much longer, but we are still in a time of year where you, in free response, you will have questions where you have to explain why something is the way it is. Two sentences or less. Here's the concept they will sometimes ask you about. Vapor pressure. Guys, vapor is just a fancy word for what? Vapor. Gas. Gas pressure. Do you guys remember way back, first quarter, how did I ask you to visualize the concept of pressure? Does this ring a bell? Collisions. Collisions, yeah. How often are these gas particles striking the side of their container? If there are a higher number of collisions, then that must mean high pressure. Fewer collisions, less pressure. Okay? Again, this is tied to intermolecular forces. Okay? You will be asked questions where you'll be given two compounds and it'll say which one has the higher vapor pressure. Well, here's the, re here's the relationship. Don't memorize it. Let's understand it. Okay? There's a vocabulary word here that I want you to know. Volatile or volatile. If you describe a person as having a volatile personality, what kind of person are we talking about? Short-tempered, okay, easily angered, explosive, okay? Guys, that definition is not that different for when we use that in here. Volatile liquids. I have a cabinet back in my chemical storeroom that is my volatiles cabinet, all right? Volatile liquids, things that are flammable, explosive. Can you think of some liquids that would be flammable or explosive? Alcohols, what else? I mean, just in everyday life. Gasoline, if I had gasoline. I don't, but that's where I would keep it. How about, do you know the active ingredient in nail polish remover? Acetone. Acetone is a volatile liquid, okay? These are flammable liquids. We don't want them just laying out on the counter because they are flammable or explosive. Now, why are they flammable or explosive? Volatile liquids are liquids that evaporate very easily, okay? Volatile liquids are liquids that evaporate very easily. And think about it. All of those things we just mentioned, alcohol, gasoline, um, nail polish remover, propane, things like that, these are all liquids that have a very strong smell. Would you agree? That's because they vaporize easily. Perfumes, Axe body spray, my favorite. You know, I love it very volatile, okay? But guys, you, let's, let's bring this back to intermolecular forces. If something evaporates very easily from liquid to gas, what do you think? Does, if it evaporates easily, does that mean that it is held, the liquid is held tightly together or loosely together? Loose. So what kind of intermolecular forces are we talking about? Weak, okay? 
liquids that have very weak intermolecular forces will have high vapor pressures. Okay? They pull apart easily. They turn into gas easily. Lots of gas, lots of pressure. And the opposite is true. Liquids that are held together very strongly, like water, for example, low vapor pressures. Water is not considered a volatile liquid. It does not evaporate easily because it's held so tightly together. Okay. So let's, let's review here for a second. I've drawn this structure up on the board. This is water, obviously. This is acetone. And nail polish remover. Does this have London dispersion forces? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all covalents do. It's not a symmetrical molecule, so it is polar, so that means it has dipole dipole, okay? Does it have hydrogen bonding? But it's it's got hydrogen, it's got oxygen. Good, they're not bonded. This does not have hydrogen bonding. So you guys tell me, which of these liquids will have the higher vapor pressure? Acetone or water? Acetone. More easily evaporated, more gas, more pressure. That's the kind of question you might see on free response, okay? You have to be able to explain why this has the higher vapor pressure, and it's because of its intermolecular forces, which you would then tell me which ones it has, okay? There's a relationship to temperature as well, okay? And this shouldn't be hard to understand. I don't care if we're talking about a solid, a liquid, a gas, doesn't matter. When you raise the temperature of anything, what happens to the particles, the atoms and molecules, physically? If you heat something up? Yeah, they move faster. They move faster, they have higher energy. If you heat up a liquid, do you think that's, could that cause that liquid to more easily jump into the gas phase? Sure could. All right. So what's the relationship here? If temperature goes up, what happens to vapor pressure? It also goes up. That's a direct relationship, which is why you want to be careful how you store volatile liquids. So it's a direct relationship. This, um, this drawing is taken out of your textbook. The gist is, what they're trying to, to illustrate here, though, is this, this relationship right here. That's all. And let me show you how glad you should be that you are not a few years older and taking this course a few years earlier. Don't write that down. Don't write it down. Okay? This is something that used to be on the AP exam. The only reason I'm putting it on here is because those of you that go on to take higher levels of chem, you will use these equations, right? These equations are just mathematical illustrations of that direct relationship between temperature and vapor pressure. That's all, okay? Again, those of you that go on to take higher levels of chem, you will use these equations to solve for the heat of vaporization. You'll love it. Thank you. I think she knows that. <laughs> Maybe she does. Okay. All right, so we've talked boiling. Just to make sure you guys realize, melting is also breaking intermolecular forces. Okay, I'll talk more about this, um, what's going on with the temperature during phase changes. I'll talk more about that next week. 
But if we're talking melting, ladies and gentlemen, you won't see the heat of vaporization. You'll see the heat of fusion. Okay, we'll get to those calculations later on. And then the last thing I want to say, guys, is just is really a real world connection here. And I just want to make sure you are aware of this. Okay, let's say your parents come to you and they say, you're cooking dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. Which for me would be terrible because I don't know how to cook anything, okay? In my house, if I have to cook dinner, it's like one of two things. We're either having pancakes or we're having spaghetti. <laughs> That's about all I can handle. Okay, so let's say you go the spaghetti route. When you put a pot of water on the stove and you start to heat it up, have you ever noticed those little bubbles that form on the bottom of the pot and eventually they break free and they go to the surface? Do you know what's in those tiny little bubbles? Water vapor, to be specific. Water vapor is what's inside those bubbles. And here's the deal, which you may or may not be aware of. Boiling does not occur until the pressure inside those little bubbles, which is the same thing as saying this, the vapor pressure of that liquid, and the pressure inside those little bubbles is equal to the pressure in the room or the atmosphere. That's when boiling occurs. Okay. Now at sea level, ladies and gentlemen, like if we weren't here at Oakton, we were in Virginia Beach, right at sea level, what is standard pressure? What's the number? One ATM. Okay, well, we're not at sea level here at Oakton. We're about 300 feet above sea level. Our, quote, standard pressure isn't actually one atmosphere. We're a little bit below. We might be like 0.998 ATM. But let's go extreme. You've decided to hike Mount Everest. Good for you. All right. And you know you have to stop. You you only, you know you don't hike the whole mountain in one day. That's impossible. And you're camped halfway up Everest. Well, on Everest, ladies and gentlemen, the atmospheric pressure is much much lower. Okay. All right. You're on the side of Everest. You're camping. You've got your tent, you're going to boil water, you're going to make tea. Or I don't know, maybe you're having a pasta party on the side of the mountain. I don't know, whatever. But you've got your pot of water. Think about it. If the pressure in your environment is low, the pressure pushing down on the surface of your pot of water is low, is it going to take more or less heat to get your water to boil? less. Well, guess what? That means on Everest, water doesn't boil at 100 degrees. We actually looked it up this morning. It boils at like 75 degrees. Like it's a pretty significant difference. Now think about that for a second. On Everest, if water boils at 75 degrees and you're having your pasta party on the side of the mountain, is it going to take you longer to cook your pasta or less time? Which one? Longer. People think about it. The water's not as hot. You're going to have to cook your pasta for longer because the water isn't as hot as it is here in Oakton. Okay. Now, how many of us are hiking Everest? Basically none of us. Okay, maybe you. All right. But what if you live in like Denver, Colorado, for example? That's realistic. They call Denver the mile high city. Denver is about 5,000 feet above sea level. The pressure, the atmospheric pressure in Denver, Colorado is low. In fact, it's so low that like when um, sports teams go to travel to play like the Denver Broncos, for example, sometimes these football players from other places have trouble there because the pressure is low. There's less oxygen in the air. They have trouble. You see them on the sidelines with like oxygen masks. Okay. But if you're in Denver, water doesn't boil at 100 degrees in Denver. It boils at like 95 degrees. 
So for those of you that ever um, that bake regularly or cook regularly, sometimes when you're reading a recipe, there'll be an alternate set of directions at high altitudes because if I'm making pasta in Denver, I have to cook my pasta for longer than I would if I live here in Oakton. Okay? Either cook it longer or maybe I have to set my oven temperature a little higher. Okay? Now what about the opposite? Okay? Do you guys know what a pressure cooker is? You ever seen one of those? Looks kind of like a crock pot. Okay? You put food in there, you put the lid down, and you like screw it down or you clamp it down. It creates inside the pot this high pressure so not low pressure but high pressure environment what's the advantage well shorter cooking times yeah if you're let's say you're cooking rice for example okay inside that pressure cooker water doesn't boil at 100 maybe it boils at 105 so you can cook it for less time okay so those are kind of just real world things, but I just wanted you to be aware of that, okay? So, again, we've already talked about this, this HVAPE. We will get to that next class when we get to the math of these things, okay? And that's it for today, ladies and gentlemen.